Okay, so chapter 21 <coughs> is about genomes and their evolution. Genomes referring to the complete set of chromosomes and genes that an organism has. <coughs> so um, some of the first work in doing this was attempting to um, well, first, just looking at chromosomes, when you stain them, you can see different kinds of bounding patterns and on those chromosomes, and that centromeres are located in different spots. Um, so then um, we talked about the kind of work that T.H. Morgan did, these linkage maps. It was a further way to kind of get details of what uh, was on those what's on those chromosomes essentially the different genes that are there and their again their relative position not their exact location necessarily um, then the next level is what um, we call physical mapping and that looks at distances between the different genes and um, uh, physical locations on the chromosomes and it then incorporates um, the sequencing of those different fragments of the chromosomes. And all this together kind of gives you a, a better look at chromosomes, the genes that are on them, and ultimately the sequence of bases that are on that chromosome. Um, this, this sequencing, we talked about the Sanger method, but another method is what's called the shotgun method, which is related to this physical mapping up here, in which you essentially can take a piece of DNA, a whole chromosome if you want, and you can use some uh, restriction enzymes and just cut it into a bunch of uh, pieces. And you take those separate pieces, and as we talked about in the previous chapter, you can clone them um, using bacteria. Uh, or sometimes viruses, and you can make copies of them. And that gives you lots of material that then you can sequence those different pieces and those different clones. And so you don't necessarily know the piece that a particular clone is incorporated, where it comes from on that chromosome, but um, there should be enough overlap between those pieces that you can then basically use computing power to figure out um, the order in which those pieces go due to the similarities of those overlaps, that is the, the complementarity of those overlaps. And it's, like I said, an alternative to the Sanger method, and it's sort of considered a somewhat quicker method because you just chop the whole chromosome up make copies of all those pieces and then sequence those pieces and that allows you to then get the whole chromosome at sort of one time. So now all this work, um, particularly with the sequencing of the human genome and, and particular genes and chromosomes and such, has provided us a vast quantity of information and um, sort of the study of this, all this biological information is what's called bioinformatics and it can be the study of literal, literally DNA sequences, base sequences, it can be studies of proteins and amino acid sequence and proteins, any number of things. And we're going to do a, a exercise in this um, coming up soon. In particular we're going to use this thing called BLAST which is a website that allows you to analyze some of this bioinformatic information. And this is the Journal of Bioinformatics here. They've got their own journal. And there are biologists, scientists who essentially spend their time on computers analyzing sequence and other data that other people have gathered. And we'll do a little bit of this. This stands for, BLAST stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. And so we're going to basically compare sequences between different species and look for the similarities between them. And this, this website and this BLAST uh, tool allows us to make those comparisons by looking again at the similarities between them. <coughs> now also within bioinformatics is the study of proteins and 
it's called proteonomics, which, uh, so this is sort of the, the level at which you can do these different studies. You can, of course, focus on the DNA and do sequencing and look at, look at genes and then the functions of those genes, particularly through the mRNAs that are produced by a given cell, and you can see which genes are being used. And then those mRNAs, of course, result in uh, the production of certain proteins, and so proteonomics is when you're um, sort of figuring out what those proteins are doing, which ones are being expressed in a cell, how they, if at all, they're interacting with each other, those different proteins help carry out processes, um, leading to um, essentially the establishment of the metabolism for that cell, the, the sum of the chemical reactions. And so you can see you're getting greater complexity as you go down, but by maturity on the side here, what they mean is the degree to which it's been studied. So we have the greatest maturity or greatest level of study at the genomics level and the least the metabolic level. So there's still a lot of work to be done down here and a lot of folks uh, focusing on that. And this also relates to what in the book they call systems biology where, again, you're looking at these different levels of organization within cells and attempting to get a holistic picture of what's going on in them, a sort of a complete look at the at the metabolism for that cell. The genes that are expressed, the proteins that are produced, what those proteins are doing, how they're interacting with each other, how they're helping to carry out different reactions, um, whether it's the secretion of materials from the cell or the tr moving of vesicles around the cell, how does that happen, what's causing that to happen. Um, what things facilitate RNA processing, for example. You can see all these different things here that are involved with <coughs> studying the, the whole system. All right, now genomes, as we said, this is sort of the complete set of genes and chromosomes and all the nucleotides that an organism has. And so we can, we can see that um, there's quite a bit of variation amongst different species. So we look at bacteria here. These are in millions of base pairs. So we can see Haemophilus influenza has about 1.8 million base pairs, E. coli 4.6 million. You can see the number of genes that they have in their genome. Um, and essentially per million bases, how many genes they have. And so the in the list, it generally goes from smaller to larger genomes here. But now you'll notice that while the number of genes increases when we go up to eukaryotes, there's not an exact fit between the genome size and the number of genes, because you can see rice, for example, has a relatively small genome compared to animals, but it has quite a few genes. You can see in in humans, we have three billion base pairs in our genome, but s around or slightly less than 21,000 genes. So we have fewer genes, as far as we can tell, than rice or corn, but a larger genome. And so that leads us to, again, this gene density. You can see bacterial genomes are extremely gene dense, nine over 900 genes per million bases, whereas you can see in us, we have seven genes per million bases. Um, the giant panda only has nine. So with these organisms, like us, they have low gene density. So in essence, there's a lot of extra non-coding DNA in us. Um, there's relatively little coding stuff. <coughs> and in the next section, we'll talk about these in more detail, but here's a list of some of this non-coding stuff. We've already talked about non-coding RNAs, the RNAs other than mRNAs. We looked at some of those regulatory sequences that we see in eukaryotes, those upstream regions that are involved with regulating whether transcription occurs. Um, but let's move on to the next section and talk about some of these things. So here's sort of uh, looking at the human genome and of all the um, uh, bases that we have of all, the, all our genome, you can see relatively little of it is actually 
um, coding stuff, the exons. And you can see here the introns, those regulatory sequences. Non-coding, unique non-coding DNA, and that's stuff like these non-coding RNAs and these pseudogenes, which are genes that are no longer functional. They've acquired a bunch of mutations. But you can see all the various shades of green here. That's all this repetitive DNA that we have. There's lots of it. So, what's that stuff doing? Or how does it arise, first of all? Well, let's talk about transposons. Um, of the repetitive DNA, you can see a lot of it is tr are transposons, or these what are known as transposable elements, approximately 75% of it. And of the total genome, about 44% are these transposons. That is 75% of the repetitive are transposons, and transposons are 44% of the total. Transposons were discovered by this person, Barbara McClintock, who won a Nobel Prize for them. She discovered them in corn, and these splotches in the corn are due to these transposable elements. What are they? They're sections of DNA that basically um, their job seems to be to make copies of themselves and they use an enzyme to do this called transposase and then that copy moves somewhere else into the genome and inserts itself and there's also another type of transposons and these are called retrotransposons and then them they have um, transcription of an RNA that basically codes for making a reverse transcriptase, which then causes that RNA to be used to make some DNA, and then that DNA inserts somewhere else. So you get the same result as your basic transposon, but retrotransposons have this extra step. And so these transposons just make copies of themselves and spread around the ALU element that we studied with our PCR lab is an example of one of these transposons and you can see those make up by themselves about 10 percent of the human genome we looked at just one of them on chromosome 16. these allo inserts the variation between organisms has been used to sort of create um, family trees if you will and so the arrangement and types of allo inserts that humans have is most similar to chimps and then chimps are quite similar to bonobos and then next is gorillas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These organisms are closest relatives out there, the primates. Um, we'll talk about creating these trees in a later chapter, but using um, genetic data is one way to create these family trees. All right, so other than Transposons, there's other, all sorts of repetitive DNA out there. These simple sequence DNA, just multiple copies of DNA repeated again and again. Here you can see we've got GTTAC just repeated again and again and again. And these are known as short tandem repeats. Sometimes there's longer ones, but the short ones are anywhere from two to five nucleotides long. We talked about telomeres earlier, and they consist largely of these short tandem repeats and also the centromeres, these good examples of non-coding stuff that just have this repetitive DNA that, as we saw in the case of the telomeres, is there to sort of protect the ends of chromosomes, as we saw during DNA replication, how they get shorter and shorter, and so you're just whittling off pieces of this repetitive DNA. Um, now, the um, increase in the genome of um, eukaryotes can also be due to the duplication of genomes that we'll see in one of the later sections, and so we'll talk more details there, but things like RNAs consist of multiple genes, globins consist of multiple genes that have been duplicated through time, and so this has increased the amount of DNA that humans have and the complexity that we have. And we'll talk about that more in the next section.